Well, hello, and welcome to your evidence-based emergency medicine project. The purpose of this project is for you to take a clinical question that you have taken from one of your patients and search for the answer in the medical literature. And so what I hope to do with these videos is give you a systematic approach to do that. And the process basically boils down to this. The first thing you have to do is identify a clinical problem then formulate that into a structured clinical question. Then you go search the literature to find the best evidence. Then determine how valid that evidence is. Determine the results and finally apply it to your patient. Another way I've seen this presented is the first thing you want to do is assess the patient, then ask a clinical question, acquire the evidence, appraise the evidence's validity, so appraise it, and that includes its validity as well as looking for its usefulness in clinical practice, meaning determine the results, and finally apply that evidence to your patient. This way everything starts with the letter A. And how awesome is that? So we'll talk about formulating a clinical question in a little bit, but there are really four main types of clinical questions that you could ask. And those are questions of therapy, diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. So questions of therapy might be something like how an intervention would affect a patient outcome, like are steroids useful in sepsis? Questions of diagnosis are used to determine how good a test is in between in determining between a patient with a disease process and one without a disease process. Questions of harm are kind of like the opposite of therapy in the sense of does a particular exposure make a patient worse? Like does CT radiation cause cancer in, in little kids? And questions of prognosis aim to estimate a patient's future course. Now due to the different nature of each one of these questions, certain kinds of study designs are more useful in each one. So a randomized controlled trial would be great for therapy. Some people get the new therapy and some people get a placebo. Now for harm studies, you can't do that. You can't say some people are going to be given a placebo and some people are going to be given some sort of obnoxious stimulus that could potentially harm them. That's not ethical. So the study design has to be different. So the best study design for questions of therapy are always the randomized controlled trials. After that comes a cohort study, then a case control, and finally a case series. And I'll explain what each one of these means next. For questions of diagnosis, the best study is a prospective blind comparison to a gold standard. For questions of harm, randomized controlled trials, if you can do them, but sometimes these are not ethical. Otherwise, the next one is going to be a cohort, followed by a case control, study, and then finally a uh, case series. For questions of prognosis, it'll be cohort, case control, and case series. So now let's look at the different types of studies. In a randomized controlled trial, you take a group of patients and then randomly decide which one will get therapy and which one will get a placebo. And then you measure the outcome in each group. In the best studies, the patients don't know whether they're getting a treatment or a placebo. The treating doctor doesn't know whether the patient got a, a, a treatment or a placebo. And the person assessing the outcomes at the end also doesn't know whether they got a placebo or a treatment. So everyone is blinded to this little fact here. And the purpose of that is really to eliminate any bias that might come in. So these are randomized controlled trials and they're the best study methodology we can do but they're not always possible so let's look at some observational studies and one type of the observational study is the cohort trial and here you take one group of people who already have a disease or are getting a treatment or are somehow exposed to something so that corresponds to one cohort and then you compare them to a matched group of other patients, and this cohort would be your control. And they don't have that therapy or exposure or harmful stimulus or whatever that the cohort does, the cohort that was exposed. So you have two cohorts, really. You have one that is exposed to something or is getting a treatment, and you get another one that is 
hopefully matched to the other one, but they don't have that exposure. And then you follow these guys forward in time and you see if any of them develop the outcome that you're looking for. So the big difference here between this and the randomized trial is that these two groups are not randomized to one get the treatment and the other one not to. And so you may not be able to eliminate other factors. So let's say, for instance, your first cohort are smokers and you're looking for heart disease and this group is uh, not smokers, they're not smokers, then this, this, this cohort who smokes may also eat a lot of bacon and they don't really care about healthy stuff because they smoke, whereas these guys probably exercise more and don't eat as much bacon. So without the randomization, it's hard to control for all these other factors which might also cause the outcome. Now let's look at another observational study design and that's the case control. Now similarly here we're going to have two groups of patients except now we're going to start with the outcome and so we're going to have one group of patients who is already suffering from whatever outcome there is that we're looking at and we'll call that group the case group and the other group we try to match to these case groups and they're not suffering from that so we'll call this the control group now this may be more beneficial in diseases that are rare or take a long time to develop. So let's say that you're talking about um, uh, pelvic cancers in daughters of patients who took uh, diethyl stilbarol. Uh, so that takes like a generation to develop and so you can't guess which patients are going to have it or not. But you could gather a group of those patients who have that cancer and a group of similar women who don't have that cancer and then look back in time and determine what they may or may not have been exposed to. So you could look at various factors here like did the patient smoke, did the patient's mother smoke, did the patient's mother take DES, did the patient's mother drink a lot of coffee and you could look back at a lot of different factors in this case control study design. However, this is all in the past, so you have to really rely on medical records or the patient's recollection. And so there's a lot of bias involved in that. Patients may only remember bad things or good things, or, or they may not recall at all. And so you could see the limitation of the case control study design. Let's just talk about a couple other ones real quick. Uh, the first one is a case report, and this is where a physician would describe a patient that had a particular outcome. There's no use of any controls and there's really no statistical validity to this kind of uh, study. A case series looks at several case reports and tries to look for commonalities. And again, there's no control group and there's really no way to draw any um, causal relationships. However, th these case series and even the case reports can start people recognizing patterns and then prompt them to do another kind of study. Systematic reviews will probably look at a bunch of different randomized controlled trials and observational studies, usually focusing on one particular topic and looking for a, a specific question to answer. They review the studies, assess them, and then summarize them and sometimes even provide recommendations. And finally, a meta-analysis will take a bunch of studies, usually randomized controlled trials, pool all the patients together, and then reanalyze the data as if that was just one giant study so they can get bigger numbers that way. And so these could be pretty powerful studies. Okay, that's it for the first video. So go out there, see some patients, and uh, formulate some questions. And then on the next video, we'll determine how to take that question that you have and turn it into a structured clinical question that you can take to the literature and, and try to find an answer.